Now, I gave you an example with one example, Mrs. Grant, how a lack of thinking about the system, designing pharmacy work relative to pharmacy, not relative to nursing, is a failure mode. And how, even if you have a system, ignoring the weak signals that there's something wrong with the system can lead to catastrophe. Right, that's a nursing example. It turns out, it turns out, if you look at other examples of catastrophe, you think when you start looking, oh, there must have been that one idiosyncratic major factor which caused the catastrophe. It turns out if you start looking, you're going to be come up empty on finding catastrophe which is linked back to one idiosyncratic major factor. Almost all catastrophes have this, this, this issue of lots of little things which go wrong all the time having gone wrong when the catastrophe occurred. The only thing unusual is the combination in which they went wrong on that particular day. So let me give you uh, one or two examples uh, before we conclude this session. NASA has a storied history of space exploration, both unmanned exploration with these probes like Voyager, the Hubble Space Telescope, and of course manned exploration. But tied in with this storied history of great accomplishment is some great tragedy. See, the thing is out of you know, a dozen plus flights of Apollo and a hundred plus flights of the space shuttle, NASA's lost three crews. You say, well, after all, you know, what NASA does is very dangerous stuff, sending people uh, manned missions into very hostile environments. When you look, though, at the catastrophes NASA has suffered, it turns out the organizational failures are nearly identical to the organizational failures which prove the undoing of Mrs. Grant. So let's take a look at the Columbia Space Shuttle. For those of you who remember this, what happened was the Columbia Space Shuttle took off. It seemed to be perfectly fine. It was fine in its mission, but on the way back into the Earth, through the Earth's atmosphere, it disintegrated and, and, and scattered itself while killing the crew from California all the way to Texas. What was the cause? Well, at first it seems idiosyncratic. During takeoff, there's this orange foam on the outside of the space shuttle, and the foam, some of it shed off the, this external fuel tank, hit the leading edge of one of the wings, cracking a heat tile. Didn't matter during takeoff, and it actually didn't matter during the mission. But on the way back through the atmosphere, when the space shuttle was losing tremendous amounts of speed due to tremendous amounts of friction with the air, very hot gases got in through this crack, melted the internal structure of this wing. The wing disintegrated. The captain of the uh, the pilot of the space shuttle lost control. The shuttle tumbled out of control and shredded itself um, before the parts of it landed on the ground. So, oh, what are the odds of that happening? Well, it turned out the odds of that happening were tremendous. See, the thing is, the thing is, when NASA started going back and investigating previous shuttle launches, saying, well, what are the odds? It turned out on every single launch, not approximately, but every single launch, foam fell off the external fuel tank. You say, well, yeah, but what are the odds of it hitting the space shuttle? It turned out every time a space shuttle landed, it needed its uh, tiles to be repaired because they had been impacted. Many of the impacts do based on video, uh, 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 video analysis, based on being hit by this foam. So what are the chances of big cracks? Well, it turned out there were a lot of big cracks. What are the chances of cracks on the leading edge where the wing is most vulnerable to the penetration of hot gas? It turned out there have been cracks there too. So what was unusual about this? Well, none of the individual factors, all the factors that happened before, the only thing unusual was the combination that this piece of foam had hit that spot on the wing and caused a large crack right there. That was the only thing unusual. So you ask yourself the question, how could NASA over the course of 100 some odd launches been so tolerant of such a, such a situation? And the reason NASA, NASA was so tolerant of such a situation is NASA fell exactly into a behavior we all fall into and consequently a behavior about which we should all be on the alert. NASA did something which is called a normalized deviance. See, the thing is, when engineers first designed the space shuttle, a couple of things they said. One, the foam should not fall off the external fuel tank. It's very dangerous if it does. The reason is these heat shields which protect the spacecraft on reentry, they're marvelous at deflecting heat, but they're very fragile and we don't want to hit them. Well, what happens on the first flight? The space shuttle comes back with cracks in the heat tiles. But what was the consequence? Nothing. It landed safely. And then the second time, it lands, and it lands safely. And NASA started to behave, behave, as if this was just perfectly normal. And what became a don't fly kind of condition 
became termed a turnaround situation, which is if foam hits the spacecraft and causes a crack, during the turnaround from one mission onto the next, we'll fix the tile. Now here's the thing. The people who designed that spacecraft, the people who designed its missions, the people who managed its missions probably had tremendous training as engineers. And in the course of their training, of course, they had training as statisticians. And you know in statistics that you can't reach any meaningful conclusion unless you have a very, very large sample set. So you know what you're observing actually is really something true and just not random noise. Designing the space shuttle, who knows how many countless pi uh, trials, pilots, iterations they did to come up with their design. Yet, flying the space shuttle one time, two times, five times, ten times, very, very small sampling, somehow in the back of their heads they said, ah, see, it proves it's safe to fly it even though the foam falls off, even though cracks occur in the heat shields. Now, it's easy to condemn NASA for that type of behavior, but it turns out that is just so darn common. It's so common, in fact, that's why we've got a term for it, normalizing deviance. So, to tie this all together, what we really want out of healthcare is a breakthrough on quality, breakthrough on access, and breakthrough on affordability. How are we going to get that? We're going to get that by having a much more reliable approach to designing, operating, and improving the complex systems in which we're embedded, upon which we depend, and for which we're responsible. But before we start focusing on those, on those good behaviors by which we achieve broad-based, high-speed, non-stop improvement and innovation, we should also have in the back of our head a warning, a light blinking all the time about the failure modes. Be careful. Be careful if you're managing a component, if you're managing a specialty, if you're managing a piece of the larger whole without an eye towards that piece in service to the larger whole. And here's another warning. Be careful. Be really aware when you see a problem and you don't call it out. Because right now that problem may be inconsequential it may be small, it may, may be nothing but a minor aggravation. But you don't know how that little problem will conspire with another little problem, will conspire with yet another little problem to cause a catastrophe like it did for Mrs. Grant, like it did for the Columbia, and like they do for just about every other catastrophe about which we can understand. Thank you.